my father grew up in a Southern Baptist family, my mother in a Jewish family, and uh, that's really kind of the milieu I was raised in. I went to school in Germantown. Um, you might ask why I didn't go to school in my neighborhood, um, which is actually a funny story. Uh, my mother worked in it for social services. So at that point in time, she wasn't in a managerial position. She used to have to go door to door and visit people in their homes to uh, help with their children. And uh, she used to get updates from the district attorney about where safe places were, where safe places weren't. So the neighborhood I was going to elementary school was one of those unsafe places. So uh, my mother, knowing social work and knowing how you know, governmental organizations work, she said that, uh, said that we were white. And the school in Germantown needed more white students for diversity, so they took us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's how we got there. Um, I went to the Jewish Children's Folk School, which is part of an organization called CSJL, which is the Congress for Secular Jewish Organizations. Uh, my mother is actually the director, the executive director of this organization to this day. Um, and it was an interesting experience. I'll just be 100% honest with you. Um, I hated it. I thought everyone there was weird. Um, I couldn't wait till the bar mitzvah so I didn't have to show back up again. Um, I clung to a friend named Ellie who thought the place was weird also. And we basically, every Sunday we showed up, we just ran amok and got on people's nerves. And <laughs> that's how I enjoyed <laughs> the first, you know, uh, six, seven years of my Hebrew school experience. I just, um, when I was growing up, uh, I didn't grow up around many Jewish people. There was one Jewish kid in the elementary school I went to, and um, I thought he was kind of strange. Uh, when Christmas season would come around, he'd like throw temper tantrums and like start kicking a tree in the um, playground and say, I hate Christmas. And um, I thought it was kind of weird when I was a kid. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> so that's, that's really um, the only people I knew uh, that were really Jewish was my family. My family's a little bit quirky, so I really didn't identify as Jewish growing up. Um, I was just another kid in the city. Um, and as I got older, it really started to bother me. Um, you know, I had a friends, one of them I'm still very good friends with, but whenever the holiday season would come up, they'd always mention Hanukkah, and I would just always kind of have like a visceral reaction to that. Like I wouldn't get angry, but just made me very uncomfortable, just to feel different. You know, like, why couldn't I just be like everybody else? You know? Um, I, I really think that that's kind of natural for a teenager. And even in my older years, as I was becoming what I am now, um, the first time I ever put on a, a yarmulke and I walked outside, like, I just, like, felt like there was, like, a big red arrow over my head, <laughs> like, making everyone, like, look at me, look at me. But uh, as I came to realize it, I, I really don't think most people notice. Um, and even where I work now, it's, it's the subject of a lot of questions. But I realize as long as I'm okay with the, those questions, they really don't turn into big problems. I find that you know, the students that I work with, they're just, they're just interested. They don't see Jewish people. They know nothing about it. The only people they ever see wear hats on their head are Muslim people in their neighborhoods. And I just, again, I find out the more comfortable I am with myself, no matter what spectrum of religiosity you are, whether you know you only show up for Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, that's where you are now, or whether you wear a black hat and <laughs> tuxedo 24/7, you know it's really about just being comfortable with who you are. Um, my bar mitzvah came up, and um, the bar mitzvahs where I went to Sunday school is very different than a traditional bar mitzvah. It was really they gave you a mentor and you had to um, kind of just work on a project related to Jewish history. So I was quite the goofball when I was a kid, so I did mines on Jewish comedians. And, um, it was interesting. Um, I, I had to go out with a, a guy, and we went out for Chinese food and talked about Jewish jokes for like six months of my life. And, and I had, <laughs> then I had to give a presentation on it, and. That was honestly really my last experience with Judaism. Um, as I got older, I just 
cared less and less about Hanukkah. I only did it because it's something my mom wanted to do. Um, and uh, my mom was very, she's a wonderful mom, but she's very, like, you know, diverse. So my father could care less about Christmas, but my mom made sure we did it because that's, you know, what our family was. You know, we were a mixed family. And, uh, um, so uh, we moved to Abington in 2001. So I went to Abington Junior High School, and uh, I graduated from Abington. Um, my experience in high school was pretty challenging. I don't want to get into too many details. But I left in a, uh, I had to end up in a behavioral school. So you could just use your imagination. Um, and I graduated, and I um, started fixing cars. I went to tech school, and um, that's what I did. I gra had a job from the time I graduated high school to, uh, to now. Now I'm a teacher. I teach how to fix cars, um, but it's still related to what I did in high school. Um, that was pretty much my life. Um, when I was about 22 years old, um, I had a, a ground-shattering event. Um, uh, that's, that's what it is. Um, so it really made me challenge some of my basic assumptions about life in general. Um, I want to rewind for a second um, back to when I was seven years old. This is a true story. I was watching Rugrats, as any good seven-year-old does, and um, at the end of the, you know, when the end of a show comes on, there's always like the screens of like who produced the show and everything like that. So whoever produced the Rugrats used to have this wolf that would howl at the moon. There it was. So I was watching this, and I broke down crying, and I ran to my mother, and I said, I wish I would have never been born. And so she said, why? I said, because then I wouldn't have to die. I don't know, for whatever reason, at that moment in my life, it just kind of hit me. Like, one day I won't be here. <clears throat> and it was like, that feeling carried through my life. Um, today, I'm a lot more comfortable with that question that I have. Um, but it really bothered me as a kid. Um, I don't know why I was constantly plagued with thinking about that kind of stuff, but uh, it happened. And um, a couple uh, years after that, my father was in a very serious car accident that left him in the hospital for about six months, I think. Um, my mother, again, working her social work magic, somehow got the uh, <laughs> county to help pay for a hospital bed in my father's home so they didn't have to pay somewhere. I don't know. I don't know what it was. But uh, my father brought a hospital bed home. And I remember one day I was sitting next to him. I was very nervous to just be near him. I, I don't know, I thought I would hurt him or something. And I just asked him, I said, uh, I asked him, I said, are you scared to die? And uh, he said, yeah, but what can I do about it? <laughs> and um, that was really, you know, not to be morbid, but my, my, my question that's haunted me my entire life is really, why am I here? What is the point? So I'd like for you guys through the remainder of what we're discussing to just really kind of think about that question because it's not really a question you should avoid because the fact of the matter is you only get one life and it should all be to 120 years but what are we doing with it and what are you doing with it you know um, and if you don't know what you're doing with it <laughs> that's a problem also you know, how many times do we hear stories and stories of older people? You ask an older person right when they're about to pass, what would you do? I would have yelled at my spouse less. I would have paid more attention to my children. I would have gone to religious services more. I would have, you know, I would have just spent more time living a quality life. That's it. But by, unfortunately, by then, it's too late. And um, that was really a question I still live with every day of my life. So um, when I was 22, that came to a head. And um, I really was forced to challenge that and, and, and stand it face to face and ask myself, what am I doing with my life? Showing up to a shop and fixing cars every single day and that's it? 
That's ultimately what I end up continuing to do, <laughs> but with a very different perspective, with a very different perspective. And that's really what it is. Um, life is really just a matter of perspective. It's, it's how you look at things. And uh, it's amazing how much we can trick ourselves into thinking that the perspectives that we're used to, you know, what we grew up with, and the people we surround ourselves with and the people we work with, <coughs> how much influence they have on our perspective in life. And really to be a person who's a truthful person is to really be what Abraham, our father, was called in, in Torah, is an Ivory, an other. Be different. It's really what it means. Be different. So you may ask, how's everybody wearing a white shirt and you're all different? <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a very beautiful lesson. I know that was a quick remark, and it was a, I think it's funny. I like to laugh about it sometimes when I see myself in a white shirt. But um, the thing is, there's no religious text that says you have to do it. But the deeper meaning behind it is that what matters is what's on the inside, not what's on the outside. So don't spend 15 minutes getting dressed in the morning. Do I look good like this? Do I look good like that? Throw on your white shirt and black pants and <laughs> go on with your life. Get moving. And that's really what it means to me. Um, so, when I started questioning life, started questioning about God, God, no God, things like that, which God, <laughs> you know, because, you know, I can't be convinced otherwise that fundamentally when you speak about different religions, it's not all the same God that everyone believes in. I, I think... Um, Maybe it could be argued with certain monotheistic religions, but we'll just leave that. That's not the topic of our conversation. That's just a, a belief that I've come to, to realize through my own searching that I'll explain to you. I didn't immediately go to Orthodox Judaism. Naturally, what any good millennial will do when you have a question, you Google it. So, <laughs> you know, you Google God, what comes up? You know, about 50 church websites. I'm very happy I didn't um, ever get involved from a religious perspective um, in a church. I never was a Christian. Um, but I did get involved in a church. I went to lunch with a couple pastors that I were friendly with. Um, they ended up not remaining my friends because I didn't believe how they believed. It was very simple. Um, one guy straight out told me, I want to spend my time around people who love Jesus. I said, I guess we're not friends then. Because that's, you know, I'm asking questions. You don't like my questions? So I guess we're not friends. That's it. Um, so I spent a good couple years around a lot of people like that. I was involved in a basketball league that was a church basketball league. It wasn't like a religious requirement to be in this basketball league. But obviously, naturally, it's a church basketball league. <laughs> good majority of the people went to that church. Um, and... At that point in my life, I like to call that like the searching phase. You know, I had, uh, I would listen to debates, like on YouTube. God, not God, deism, theism. The difference is a big difference between deism and theism. Is really, theism are, is, are groups of people that believe that there's a God who plays an active role in the, in the world. Monotheism, polytheism, all right? Um, deism are people who believe that there's a supreme being that created the world. But that's it. You're just sitting back and relaxing now, watching things go. Um, I listened to a lot of debates about atheists versus non-atheists, um, which weren't really, um, it wasn't like Christians versus atheists and Jews versus atheists. You'd be hard pressed to find Jewish debates on the internet, honestly. Um, that's not something Judaism does. And for a very good reason, which I came to, to realize. Um, and that was it. I, I, that was really kind of that, that phase of my life. And um, I don't know why I didn't think of it from the beginning. Um, but again, I did another Google search. Where do you start in the Bible? And it's, you know, this book, that book, this book, that book, you know. Um, and, I, and I really thought to myself, if I went to Barnes and Nobles, and I bought a Harry Potter book. Would I go up to the to the clerk and say, "Where should I start?" No, <laughs> you start from the beginning of the book. It's like it, it's not even a question. You know, it, it, all of a sudden it comes to religion, and now we have all types of questions. 
you know, where do I start? How do I do this? But when it comes to everyday life, it's nothing. A nice, a nice example I like to think of is when you, when, when a rabbi comes to you and says, you should do this or you should believe that, hopefully not in that manner, but that's just the basic of the basis of the conversation. Our natural reaction is, why should I believe that? Who told you that that's true? Who told you that that works? Can you think of any other place in your life where you're that skeptical? Honestly. Think about the doctor you go to. Why do you go to the doctor you go to? Maybe that was your family doctor when you were a kid. Maybe you did a Google search. Maybe that's what your insurance company told you to go to. Who told you that they're a good doctor? I mean, that's, that's really like a, like a, a very serious fundamental question that all of a sudden when it comes to religion, we all always ask. And it's good to ask questions. I'm not saying that you should just blindly accept everything. But I'm saying you should hold your entire life to the same criteria that you hold religion. If you don't do something just because the rabbi says that it's a Jewish thing or it's the right thing to do, then where do you buy your lunch meat? Where do you go to the doctors? Where do you buy your shoes? Why do you only drive a Honda? Why do you only drive a Toyota? Why do you only do this and why do you only do that? Serious question. And it, it may sound cute, but it, it's a very deep and serious question. We should not live our lives in, in an in a, um, incongruous way. In other words, we should not be this type of way and skeptical over here and then just live freely and do whatever we want over here. That was another question I had. Okay. So the first thing I did after I asked myself the question of where should I start, I said, um, everybody believed that the Jewish people got the Bible, at least people that believe in God, whether you're Christian or you're Muslim or you're Jewish or any other form of anything. If you believe in monotheism, you believe that the Jewish people were the first people with the Bible. So, I got a, a JPS translation, which is a Jewish Publication Society. Um, that's what the Reform synagogues use. Um, as far as biblical scholarship goes, they don't just take into account Jewish resources. They also take into account the King James Version of the Bible, which is a Christian translation. And they basically look at biblical scholarship from a um, scholastic point of view, meaning an, uh, an educational, academic point of view, and they take into account, you know, I guess natural world history, I'll say. So I felt like it was a fair place to start. So um, I knew nothing about Hebrew at the time, so I didn't have some of the questions I had as I began to learn Hebrew. Um, but I was just so shocked by what I knew about Christianity, what I knew about Islam, because I had Muslim friends when I was growing up. Um, I went through a little phase when I was like 16, I thought I was them. Um, but uh, it, it was, I was just so shocked by, you know, I'll, I'll put it like this. What I knew about Christianity, because I did study with Christians, I, I, I studied on my own about Christianity, is that, you know, Protestant Christians have this belief. Protestant or like Baptist, you know, any, uh, I guess, anything other than Catholicism or Orthodox Christianity is basically Protestantism. They have this belief in solo scripture. It's a, it's a what do you call it? It's a, uh, it's a strong, a word that's stronger than belief. Not a dogma. Um, something they profess. Conviction. Conviction It's not the word I'm looking for, but they profess that belief. Solo Scripture. Solo Scripture, as the name implies, means that <coughs> we believe in the text of the Bible and the text of the Bible alone. We don't believe in tradition. We don't believe in what the original church fathers said. We don't believe in what the Coptic church fathers... We don't believe in anything. If it's not in the Bible, talk to me later. That's it. I think it's reasonable. <laughs> I think that's a reasonable thing to believe, or at least I thought it was a reasonable thing to believe. So basically, when I was talking to some of these, these people, there was like a vast, I wasn't able to put a finger on it, but there was a vast gulf between what they professed to believe and what they actually believed. In other words, they believed, they told me that God was a trinity. Okay, that's what you believe. 
but it doesn't say Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Christian Bible, not in one place. <coughs> okay? It's not in a single place. They basically believe, because there's different ways of saying God, that God has, is a Holy Spirit, and there's God, and then they obviously believe that Jesus is part of God, so therefore they put all this together. There can't be more than one God, because we're monotheists, right? So... Um, there can't be more than one God because we're monotheists, so therefore God must be a triune deity. Whatever, how it makes sense. Anytime I ask the question, they said it's not for us to understand. They always use scriptural support saying that the hidden things are for God to understand. We're just people. Okay. <laughs> um, so one of the things that made me make my final break um, was really, I said, so here's what you want me to believe. You want me to believe that God gave the Torah to the Jewish people and that he, for 2,000 years, chastised them, made them wander through the desert for 40 years. They went into the land and they had to fight all these wars that you know kings came up against them and there was evil kings and there was good kings and that you took them out with this plague and that they got slaughtered by these people and then all of a sudden you decided this isn't working gotta send my son so that they can be saved and life goes on that's what you're asking me to believe yeah <laughs> what you're supposed to believe so I was very very uh said it that you want me to believe that God loves everybody but yet the hundreds of thousands of Jewish people that lived before this time are burning in hell because they didn't know the truth I guess so that's what you're supposed to believe I guess so and not everyone says that some people I just want to be honest some people will say well you know, that wasn't the covenant at the time, but then the covenant changed and whatever. Again, this isn't a theological class, but that's that's just a part of my life I wanted to share. So, um, when I read this Jewish Publication Society translation, I was just struck by how clearly certain things were in the Bible. In other words, I explained to you growing up, I didn't really have any sort of interaction with religious Jewish life. So this is my first time reading a Bible, and I came across, you know, um, on this day, on the tenth day of this month, you should afflict yourselves. I was like, wow, that sounds a lot like Yom Kippur. I had a, I had a Bible on the, on the, on the tablet that my wife bought me, so I don't have the tablet anymore because I dog ate it. But <laughs> if I did, <laughs> you would see that there's a lot of notes in it. I would make notes. Does this mean Yom Kippur? Because it doesn't straight out say Yom Kippur. Um, I came across, you should wear fringes on the side of your four-corner garment. I said, wow, I remember seeing Jews with funny things hanging out of their shirts. And it said that um, you should, on the sixth day, it should be a holy day to the Lord your God. Right? I said, oh, Jewish people, they uh, shut down on the, I didn't know that it was the seventh day of the week. I thought uh, Friday was the seventh day of the week or whatever. Um, but, uh, and I also came across, today should be a day of shofar blowing for you. Wow, I remember the shofar, that was always Rosh Hashanah. In other words, I was very intrigued by how what I knew was a Jewish life actually comported with the Bible that I was reading. Not just you gotta take from here, and you gotta take from here, and gotta take from there, and then it means this, but we don't believe in tradition, so... Just use your intellectual rigor to figure it out, <laughs> you know? Um, so I was very struck by that. And that's one thing. I'm a very black and white thinker. I always have been. Some people are like that. Some people aren't like that. So I don't have a very large tolerance for things that seem incongruous. So when I came to the Jewish Bible and I saw that, you know, what Jewish people did... You could literally know nothing and read through the Bible and see that this is where it comes from. I was very intrigued by that. I was very intrigued by that. So, um, 
I was reading, and then I finally found it. I don't know. It, it's, a, it's the weirdest thing. I thought of this place called artscroll.com. I don't know why I thought of it. I'm not saying it's magic. I'm not saying God put it in my head. I'm just saying, for whatever reason, I just thought of this place called artscroll.com, and I went on it, and what do you know? They had all these things. I, I lie to you not. I don't know where I thought of this place from. I don't live in New York, so there's, you know, I've never been to a Jewish bookstore. Um, my parents never had any sort of religious texts in the house. I didn't have any religious Jewish friends. I didn't, my own religious friends were more concerned with King James Version, which Art Scroll definitely does not sell. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I just thought of it, and I saw books, and I went to um, what a basic Jewish library needed, and um, one by one, I started buying what they said you needed. So I bought a chumish, which I called the chumish at the time. <laughs> and um, I felt really weird about it. My wife didn't know about it. So uh, I would try to whatever, figure out how to get the books home so I didn't have to get questioned. <laughs> so whatever, she caught on. Uh, it probably was when I came to her and said, you know what? I'm not going to work on Saturdays because I don't want to die. <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> so uh, she thought I was nuts, and I probably was. But um, that's where I was. Um, she convinced me that maybe I should go on birthright. I never traveled outside of the country except for Canada. And um, I called... I don't need to explain, I guess, what the secular view of Orthodox people is. Mine was very much in line with that. I wanted a religious experience, so I figured who better to go with than the Orthodox people. So when I was selecting which group, I don't know if you or any of your children are of the age that they are able to go on birthright, but you get to select which group you go on. One is like they do a sports tour of Israel, like you ride on ATVs and you basically run around the whole country for 10 days and you're like really tired when you get home. I definitely didn't want that. Um, one of them is like uh, religious orthodox organizations. And um, I decided to call them. It was like Ezra Trip Israel. And I said, uh, I said I'd like to go, but uh, I'm not orthodox. Is that okay? And I don't think that the guy intended to be rude, but I was very upset by what he said. Because I told him, I said, I'd be comfortable around them, so you don't have to worry about that. And he just gave like a little like long breath over the phone and he said, well, I guess the question would be, would they be comfortable around you? I said, oh, that's very welcoming. Okay. <laughs> so I went with uh, Young Judea, which was not an Orthodox um, group. Um, but that really kind of took the wind out of me, you know? But I had to ask myself another one of these fundamental questions. And I came to realize, you don't judge Judaism by the Jews. They're people. There's mean secular people, and unfortunately there's mean from people, religious people. And um, so, that's what it was. So I came back, and I had on a yarmulke and sitzes, and I was waiting for my wife to give me a big hug. She hadn't seen me in 10 days. And <laughs> said, what's this? <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? I'm here. You know, aren't you happy to see me? She says, yeah, but what is this? <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, that's really how the next couple months of my life went. <laughs> so uh, one day, um, my sister, shortly after I got back, moved to Israel. And um, she moved to Israel on a 10-month program where she was going to teach English to first graders in a southern town in Israel called the Shtod. And after she was there for a while, she said to my mom, I said, my mom, you should come. You should come visit. My mom asked my wife, she said, you should come with me. So my wife happily obliged. She went. And... Um, I didn't know until a couple years later that uh, my wife, she, uh, when she went, she challenged, challenged some of her beliefs. And uh, 
my wife at the time was a Christian. Not, uh, she wasn't like a, you know, like a religious Christian, but that's what, how she was raised. You know, that's what she was. There was nothing wrong with that. Um, so uh, we were together for quite some time before we got married. So we decided we were going to get married after being together for four years. <laughs> so we got married, and um, I knew this was going to be problematic. Because at the time, I, I was learning everything from, and I said this in air quotes, an orthodox perspective. Okay. Um, and I knew Jewish people aren't supposed to marry non-Jewish people. And my wife told me that. <laughs> um, and she goes, well, I forget exactly what she said, but she said something to the effect of, how do you make sense to this if you know it's not right? I said, well, you know, we already have kids in the family, we live together. I think God will understand. I think God will understand. But it really did challenge me. And I was, I was really bent on making sure that our marriage was as Jewish as possible. So we ended up getting married in a Reformed Jewish congregation. I was actually surprised to find out that there's a lot of Reformed Jewish rabbis that still won't mix married people. I was blown away by that. Um, I thought it was just like, you know, Orthodox for sure, they would marry you. Conservative maybe. Reform, absolutely. They'll marry anything. That's what I thought. But I found out that that was wrong. So, um, anyway, we got married. Uh, when we were getting married, the rabbi made us come see him a couple times before we got married. Um, he asked my wife if she was interested in becoming Jewish. She said no. He said, okay, fine. You still got to come. <laughs> so, um, the Reformed congregation was really kind of like a compromise, I felt. My wife wasn't Jewish. Um, at the point in time, at least from what I understood, she didn't have any interest in becoming Jewish. And um, I wanted to be Jewish. And that's really like how a portion of our life, we kind of live separate lives for a while. You know? Um, and, but she continued to encourage me to do certain things. Um, when she came back from Israel, she said, we should start doing Shabbat. How do you do it? She said, I don't know. I said, I don't know either. So uh, that's what we started doing. We would um, make nice food and we would put on CDs for the kids to dance and we would dance with the kids in the house. And that was our Shabbat for a while. Um, and uh, <coughs> it was our form of Shabbat. Um, and I want to interject another story right here because I think this is important. So, there was a man, we'll call him Zevi. Okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, Zevi, his family was like very, very, very poor and destitute. And he was, he was, he was absolutely sure that he wanted to move away. He told his, his wife that I'm gonna go away and I'm gonna get rich and I'm gonna come back. And then we'll be okay. So, um, so Zevi got his first ticket to the first island he could go to to try to make some money. And he got there. And he was so enamored. He was miles offshore. And the whole island was glittering. Nothing but diamonds. And he got to the island and he said, wow. He started stuffing everything he had. He started throwing his clothes in the water to stuff his suitcases with the diamonds, everything. He was putting diamonds in his hat, diamonds in his mouth, in his pocket, in his shoes, everywhere that he could find. So he goes, well, that was a long journey. I'm going to go get myself something to eat. So he goes to the first restaurant he sees, and he says, give me the buffet. Give me everything you have. He said, okay, sure. So... Afterwards, the bill came out, and the waiter was kind of nervous, like, Zevi didn't look like he could afford all this food. So, Zevi said, it's not a problem. Here. Started pulling diamonds out of his pocket. Put them on the table. 
And the wait waiter just kind of like quizzically looked at him. He said, here's the money, take it. The waiter just, these, these diamonds are worthless here. They're everywhere. What are, you, what are you doing with these diamonds? We accept fish. That's what we pay each other. It's hard to find fish. That's what we pay each other, and that's our currency. So, Zebby had to wash some dishes before he left because he didn't have any money to pay for this food. And so, he stayed there for a year and did everything he could and had the most fish. He became like a fish billionaire. And he needed to get a boat for himself to fit all the fish on to go back home. And he sent a telegram to his wife and said, I'll be home in seven days. Please get the kids prepared in their best clothes so that they can greet their father respectfully, and I'd like for you to show up with the whole family. So they saw the boat come over the horizon, and the kids are jumping. They were so excited, so ecstatic. The family was just through the roof because all their days of trouble were finally over. As the boat came to the pier, they said, what is that awful smell? And Zevi with fish hanging out of his pocket and everything <laughs> jumps off the boat and he says, I'm home. <laughs> and his wife said, we're so happy to have you home. So what's the news? I, we heard you're rich now. We heard we're rich. He said, yeah, look at all the fish. He said, fish? What are you doing with the fish? They're all half rotten by now anyway. We can't even eat it. He said, but the, I'm like a fish billionaire. And his wife said, hello, they're not worth anything here. These sardines. And it hit him. He said, wow, I spent all that time away from home, and I forgot what the real currency was. Now, the real simple meaning of that story is like us in this world. That we come here, and sometimes we forget what's important. And then when the day comes that we go back home, we have fish, not the diamonds that we were sent here to get. So I ask you a question, and this goes back to what I was saying about the Shabbat that wasn't really uh, what I call a kosher Shabbat that we kept. Um, when Zebi was on that island, even if he would have took three diamonds home, would have made a difference for his family. In other words, what I'm saying to you is, you don't go from zero to 100. You have to pick up the miles which slowly. And it took me and my family a couple years. It took us dancing to CDs on Shabbat to get where we are. Okay, it, it, it took us, um, you know, eating unkosher food on Shabbos. It took us eating um, whatever we, I, Listen, that's what it is. I, I, I hope you all get the point. Um, you just pick up the diamonds where you can. And those diamonds are maybe spending a Friday night meal with your family. That's it. Put the phones away and just spend a little bit of time with your kids. Those diamonds may be holding the door for somebody. All right? Those diamonds may be, you know, bringing your kid here to a Sunday school. I mean, don't forget the question I asked earlier, like, why are we here? And, and to take it from the macrocosmic to the microcosmic, why are you here now? Why do you choose to bring your kid to Sunday school? Just continue to think about that. So, um, my wife called me one day, I was at work. She said, you know what, this is after we were married <laughs> uh, at the reform show, and she said, I'm thinking about becoming Jewish. Said, okay. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but fine. Um, I said, so what do you do? She's like, well, I already called the rabbi. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, okay. And what did he say? That's how our conversation went. Um, so then my wife, one day, she went to the challah bake that Ben Salem has 
guess three holidays ago, with her friend Tatiana, whose grandfather lives in the neighborhood. And so that's how Tatiana knew about the holiday. So my wife went, and this was all in her own journey to think if this was something she really wanted to do or not. And um, she, uh, after the holiday, they had the Shabbos project. And she said, let's go. I was very nervous, to be honest. Orthodox people, I don't know how this is going to work. You know, I tell them my wife's not Jewish, are they going to throw stones at me? That's literally how I felt. So my wife said, here's the number to call. It was a... Uh, by Moshe's cell phone, and I guess it was dark to me, but I guess Shabbos wasn't over yet, so he didn't pick up. I was more than happy. I said, great. He didn't pick up. I don't think we can go. And five minutes later, she said, well, try back. I said, oh, um, yep, yeah, didn't pick up again. So she said, come on, it'll be good for us in the kids. So finally, I called, and he picked up. You don't need for that one. <laughs> and uh, we ended up coming and I, I was very very nervous and we pull up and there's a rabbi that comes here for holidays and things and uh, he wears a he wears a very different hat and a very long jacket and he has a very long beard and uh, I said man this is not where I want to be <laughs> But he had such a smile. <coughs> and I walked in and I nervously said, uh, is Moshe here? And he says, which one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, I don't know. And then he pointed me to Rabbi Travitsky and I said, uh, no offense, Rabbi, but I think the guy I spoke to was a little younger. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. And that is how we got to Ben Salem. And, um, Back in April, uh, my wife completed her conversion with a uh, with a Jewish court in Lakeland, New Jersey. Um, we got remarried, and we're here. So, I want to share with you some of the things that I thought were um, very interesting about the Torah. I want to share with you one thing that is, if you can take some of these and pass it around. One of the things that I, I felt um, shows some of the depth in the Torah that I thought was very interesting. And also, after that, I know we're running close, but I want to end on a note or message of encouragement. So, everybody knows what a mitzvah is, correct? Mitzvah will translate as commandment, okay? So, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, Leviticus deals with uh, laws of Jewish priests. And there's a lot of laws. It's a, it's a book of law. That's what the Torah is. Um, so, there's a law that says, When a proselyte dwells among you in your land, do not taunt him. The proselyte who dwells with you shall be like a native among you, and you shall love him like yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am Hashem your God. So, the way you spell proselyte in Hebrew is like this. Here. It's a stranger. Okay? This is also how you refer to someone who converted. They underwent Geirus. Geirut. If you don't use... Uh, Ashkenazic pronunciation, but that's how you spell it, care. Okay? So let's move on to source number two. Source number two says, Sarai, Abram's wife. I know it was Sarah and Abraham, but they didn't have their names changed yet. So bear with me. So, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. Sarah said to Avram, consort now with my maidservant. Perhaps I will be built up through her. And Avram listened. He consorted with her and conceived. We go forward a couple verses. Abram said to Sarah, behold, your maidservant is in your hand. Do to her as you see fit. And Sarah dealt with her harshly. 
couple of the verses that we skipped were that Hagar actually had a, a child, and the Torah says that um, Sarai fell in Hagar's esteem. Hagar looked down at her. You've been trying with your husband for so long, didn't have a baby. One shot, now I have a kid. And uh, Sarah's response was, let's not forget who's the maid servant and who's the woman of the house. So she began to deal with her extremely harshly. Now I have a question. We say that the patriarchs and matriarchs knew all the mitzvahs, all the commandments, before the Torah was given. So presumably, Sarah should have known you're supposed to treat strangers nicely. So is anybody familiar with uh, another mitzvah, or not a mitzvah, but a concept that Hashem repays people, nida connected nida, that means measure for measure. What you do unto other people will eventually happen to you. Very different than karma. But, so let's not get it confused. But Hashem repays you for how you do other things. That goes for the good too. It's not just meant in the negative sense. If you do good things, good things Hashem will also do to you. So, I have a question. What does it add by saying that she was an Egyptian maidservant? In other words, if we read that verse that says she had a maidservant whose name was Hagar, would it have made any difference to our understanding of what we, what we read in that verse? No difference whatsoever. Could have said that she was a French maidservant. She's still a maidservant. So now to source number three. This is... In uh, a little later, a couple chapters later, Sarah saw, you can see that her name changed now. <laughs> That's one of the parts we missed, the name change. All right. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, Maki. Now, the sources explain that um, the simple meaning is that he was mocking Yitzchak. Or, I'm sorry, not Yitzchak. Yitzchak. Yishmael. Yishmael. Yishmael was mocking Sarah's son, okay? Um, because Sarai, who became Sarah, right, had a child after, before her, or after her name was changed. So that's something that we missed, okay? So she was mocking her son. So she said to Abraham, drive out this slave woman with her son. So like any good husband, he should listen. But imagine the challenge. He had to get rid of his son. And it's not, maybe you can argue he didn't care about Hagar because she was a, a maidservant. Not nice, but still, he was being asked to get rid of one of his sons. That's a challenge I don't think many people could deal with. But he listened. And I'm not going to say that he did it happily, but nonetheless, he listened. And so Abraham awoke, awoke early in the morning. Remember that? He took a bread of skin of water and gave it to Hagar. He placed them on her shoulder along with the boy and sent her off. And she departed in the desert. So there's three things from that I want us to remember. I want us to remember that it was morning. They had bread. And that it was on their shoulder. Okay? Remember those three things. So, if we move forward, okay, into the book of Exodus. All right. This is this is coming after the ten plagues. Abraham's children; these are all his great great grandchildren are now in Egypt, and they're slaves. And it says Egypt imposed itself strongly upon the people to hasten to send them out. Our sources say that they rushed them out in the morning. Rushed them out in the morning. That's one. Okay. The people 
which are the Israelites picked up dough before it could be leavened. We know that that's matzah. But what does dough make? Bread. And the verse says that they left their, their leftovers, they bound upon their shoulders. Right here. And where were they going? Out in the desert. Out to the desert. So I want to explain to you that if you see this, there's quite a, there's 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. And then we're 12 chapters into the book of Exodus. So it's quite a few chapters. At minimum, 62 chapters difference. So I, the, the basic meaning of what I just showed you is that Hashem deals with things measure for measure. Just like Hashem made Hagar the Egyptian, remember that, go out into the desert in the morning with bread over her shoulder, Hashem made that happen also to the Jews. That the Egyptians, when they were Egyptian, when they were in Hagar's homeland, they were treated unnicely. And they were rushed out in the morning with bread on their shoulders. Okay? I want you to also notice something. Hey, God. That's how you spell her name. Okay? If you change the vowels, you could call her Hager, which means the proselyte, the stranger. Okay? So, ultimately, the lesson I want us to take from this is that Abram, who had absolute faith that God was the one who controlled his life, he didn't understand what was going on. He consulted in God and said, what should I do? My wife wants me to send out the maidservant with my son. And I don't think it's right. And I don't want to do it. And God told him to do it. I know it's hard, but do it. Because ultimately, this mida connected mida, the measure for measure, that seems like Hashem was repaying Abram's children for what Sarah, his wife, did to the Egyptians' children, it was ultimately for their benefit. Because Hashem also gave Hagar's children, who was Yishmael, which by the way, Yishmael, the, the root of that word is Shma, means listen. Kale, at the end of his name, means God, means that God listens. Yishmael, that's what his name means. God listened to their cry. The non-Jews, he listened to their cry. All right? But when he sent them out, it was ultimately for the better of Yishmael because at that point, when Yishmael was crying in the desert, Hashem said that, don't worry, Hagar, that I'm going to make your children into a great nation. When the Jews went down into Egypt in droves and were sent out and driven out into the desert, it was also for their benefit, so that they could actually come to the point where they received the Torah. So, we don't understand always why things are the way in our life. Okay? And things can seem difficult and challenging, and coming from a secular perspective to uh, orthodox perspective can be world-shattering, totally different. Okay? But just know that you're here, you obviously hear the calling somewhere, okay? That this is where you want to be on a Sunday morning. Even though it may seem challenging, because your kids might not want to come here, or maybe your spouse is not into it as you are, every challenge is for your better. Every challenge is for your better. And you may not see it in your lifetime. Maybe it'll make a difference in your kid's lifetime. But isn't it worth it? Isn't it worth it? Judaism asks you to live, I'll use the, the common term, a conscious life. Conscious life. So everything you do, you know, you use the bathroom, you're thankful for it, have to say a blessing. Before you eat, you have to think, where did this food come from so that you can say the correct blessing? You have to think about what you did. All right? You get dressed in the morning. 
Okay? Put on your clothes a certain way. You have to think about what you're doing. It calls to the forefront of your mind every action of your life to think consciously. So I want that to go on something I said earlier, which was how often do we challenge our assumptions? So if you live a Jewish life, you're constantly asked to challenge your assumptions. You're constantly asked to think about every single thing you do. Isn't that real control of your life? No matter how much you think that you're in control of your life, are you really? You're just going through the motions? Okay? So even though my life may consist of, oh, I'm not allowed to eat bread until I wash my hands and I gotta say these fancy words, I can look at it that way. Or I can look at it as, I'm grateful. I'm taking control of my life because I'm not just gonna plop down at the table and start stuffing things into my face. I have to go wash, you're right. I have to go wash. And I have to sit down nicely because people sit down when they eat. And I have to think about what I'm eating before I eat it. What's so wrong with that? So, <coughs> if I were to tell you somebody woke up at 3.45 in the morning to go run 10 miles, and then they came home and they ate very specifically a 500 calorie breakfast, took a short nap, woke back up, went to a gym, worked out for two hours, ate another very specifically measured 500 calorie lunch. Did a little bit of business in the day, and then in the evening, went to the gym for another two hours, and then ate a very specifically tailored 700 calorie lunch. What would you think about that person? Discipline. Discipline. I would say, how do they have enough calories to even make through the day? <laughs> <laughs> okay? If I was to tell you that some of the world's best pianists practice eight hours a day to play the piano, what would you think about that? Profound. Wow. How did they reach such a level? Now, if I were to tell you that every day I had to wake up at 530 and I had to go and get a little fancy bag out of my closet and put this blanket over my head and wrap cow straps around my arm and say 80 pages out of a book and then rush out of the door to work and then take a break at work because I gotta, you know, I gotta pray again and take 15 minutes, 20 minutes out of my day and then, oh wait, gotta make sure I eat a very specially uh, specific meal. Can't mix it in the wrong refrigerator, can't put it in the wrong microwave, don't want anything weird happening. And then I gotta come home and then I gotta do homework with my kids and then, oh, Yet again, got to eat a very special meal. And then I have to come here again, 8 o'clock at night, and stay here for an hour and a half and learn, oh. and then pray again. What would you think of me? Kishmach. <laughs> what would your natural gut inclination be? Where do you find time? Why do you put such a burden on yourself? So again, I want to call to mind another thing we spoke about. Living a life of dissonance within ourselves. Or holding one section of our life to a different standard than we hold another section of our life. Why do you go to the doctor you go to, I asked earlier? Right? Why do you do things a certain way? This is the same, this is the same paradigm as what I'm just talking about. Why, when a pianist does it, it's so profound? Why, when a professional athlete eats such a specific meal and wakes up early in the morning to run in circles and then go punch a bag for a little bit? Wow, what a top-notch person. What discipline. But then someone who has to wake up so they can go daven, just pray, barely elicits a response. It's the same thing. An athlete does what they do so that they can be the best athlete they can be. A pianist practice so long so that they can be the best pianist in the world. 
a Jew does all these things so that they can be the best person that they can be. That's it. There's a story of one of my favorite rabbis. His name is Y.Y. Jacobs. And he had a boy come to him. And he says, he says, Rabbi, Shachris, Mincha, Mariv, these are the three davenings of the day. You know, why do I need all this stuff? And I thought God was supposed to take the people out of Egypt so that they can be free. He took them out of Egypt to bring them to a mountain and tell them, can't do this, you can't do that. There's 613 more things. They might as well stay. <laughs> At least Sparrow didn't know what they were doing in their own houses. <laughs> it's a good question, right? So he knew the boy and he said, you like to play the violin, right? Yeah. The boy said, I feel so free, so alive, so expansive when I play the violin. He said, can I see your violin? He said, sure. He was just on his way home from school, so he had it. And he pulled out this nice it's a Stradivaria violin, which is top-notch. It's like the Mercedes-Benz of violins. He says, very nice. So he pulled out his scissors from his desk and he put it on the violin and he was about to cut the strings. And the boy said, what are you doing? Are you crazy, Rabbi? Get away from my violin. Give it back. He said, nope. We know what you don't want done to yourself, you don't do to other people. You want to live freely. You want to live expansively. Let your violin strings do the same thing. Let them cut so they can be free. They can fly around in the wind and have a very, very lovely, expansive life to do whatever they want. He said, that's not how it works. In order for them to work, they have to be tied down. They have to work a certain way. They have to be in a certain position. They have to do a specific job. He said, if only your ears could hear what you just said. In order for you to be the best kid that you can be, in order for you to be the best Jew that you can be, we won't use the term tied down, but you have to live a structured lifestyle. You can't just live and go on wherever you want and do whatever you want and hang out with whatever you want and whoever you want. You have to surround yourself with the right people. You have to make sure you check in with the creator of the world three times a day. You have to make sure that you eat a certain kind of way. That you're thoughtful about what you're eating. That you think about where it came from. That's how you become the best person that you can be. So I hope that that impacted you some. So I want to I ask you a couple questions. Who knows who Mary was? The Christian says? Yeah. <laughs> Supposedly Joseph's wife. Okay. Who was Yocheved? Moses' mother. Thank you. Who was Paul? In a Christian sense. All the disciples. Okay. Who was Basia? Wasn't she Moses' um, wasn't she one of the women that uh, was the midwife that delivered? Basia was 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 uh, Pharaoh's daughter who saved Moshe. Close, good. Who knows what the book of John is? Part of the canon, Christian canon. Okay. Who knows what the book of Obadiah is? Is it in the Jewish Bible or the Christian Bible? Christian Bible. So, Yocheved, Basia, and Obadiah all belong to the Jewish tradition. Mary, Paul, and the book of John belong to the Christian tradition. So, I'm just going to assume that some of you knew who Mary, John, Paul, these people were. You grew up in America. <laughs> All right? But, and I'm going to take also an assumption that you didn't know what Obadiah, Basia, and Yocheved are. There was, a, there was a particular guy who lived in a Jewish neighborhood. And he said, you know what, Rabbi? I don't believe this stuff anymore. It sounds all nice. I get it. It's not for me. So... They called in some support. They called in a Rosh Yeshiva. There's a rabbi who runs the Yeshiva, which is a learning institution. He said, we need you to come down and talk to a certain guy. So they said, okay, I'll come down and talk to him. So he talked to the guy and he says, so, what's your problem with Judaism? What don't you believe anymore? He said, well, I don't know, rabbi. Why don't you ask me a question and I'll answer? So the rabbi said, okay. Which Masechta would you like to talk about? 
boys like, what? Zachta? Like, what are talking about? Is that okay? Which Seder would you like to talk about? Seder? Who's talking about Seder? The boy said, the, the rabbi said, what halachas do you have a problem with? Okay, fine. The rabbi is a last stitch, a last stitch effort. So what problems in the chumash do you have? Chumash? The rabbi threw up his hands and walked off. And the rabbi of this boy went to the Rosh Hashiv and he said, Why'd you just walk off? He said, Because at that point I realized I was just simply talking to someone who's unwise doesn't have any problems with Judaism. He doesn't know a thing about Judaism. <clears throat> That's another question I ask myself. How could I not believe something I knew nothing about? So you should think about that. Before you say this is not where I want to be, before you say this is not something I can do, ask yourself, what is Chumash? What is a Seder? What is a Masechta? What halachas do you have a problem with? Then you can make an intelligent decision to say this isn't for me. But until you get to that point, I'm saying this in the most gentle way, I love you all, it's not an intelligent decision to say this isn't what I believe. Right? So, if we go to source number five, and we're going to end on this. This is the culmination of the Torah. Moses is giving one of his last speeches to the Jewish people before he dies. And, and think about it. Moshe, with God's help, took these people out of slavery. He dealt with their complaining in the desert for 40 years. He helped to do miracles for them with God's help. And he did all these things for these people. And now we're coming to the culmination. What a sad moment. And the people said a similar question that we have. I can't possibly do the whole thing. It sounds like a nice idea intellectually. I understand you, Joe. But how am I going to wake up so early and do such a thing? How am I going to stop my day three times in a day and pray? How am I going to convince my kids that they can't any longer have a cheeseburger? This is what Moshe's response was. For this commandment which I command you today, it is not hidden from you and it is not distant. It is not in heaven for you to say, who can ascend to heaven for us to take it so that we can listen to it and perform it? Nor is it across the sea for you to say, who can cross to the other side of the sea for us to take it so that we can listen to it and perform it? It's not the case, Moshe says. Moshe says, rather it is very near to you it is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may do it. It's not impossible. So I just want to give you a, a little bit more of the depth, which I think is very interesting. What was the people's complaint? They're about to go into the land of Israel. Moshe is going to die on the other side of the Jordan. Moshe, who represented going up to Mount Sinai and getting the Torah for them, Moshe was their, was their shepherd. So when they said, who's going to cross the river for us? Because they were leaving Moshe behind. Next source, number six. Moses, my servant, died. This is God speaking. Now arise and cross this Jordan, you and this entire people. This is in the book of Joshua, which comes exactly after the last book of Torah. They left their lawgiver behind across the sea. The Arden is, is a is a river, Israel. Legitimate question, right? They say, who's going to go up to heaven to get it for us? Source number seven, Hashem descended upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and Hashem summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses ascended. That is the one day in history when heaven met earth. There was clouds that really should be over top of Mount Sinai, because it's not a tall mountain. It's not Mount Everest that pierces the clouds. The clouds descended on the mountain. Heaven met earth. Moses went up the mountain and got the tablets. 
But the people had another good question. Who's going to go up to heaven and get it for us? When Moses did it, you told us we weren't allowed to go up the mountain. So Moses answers, it's near to you. I gave you everything you need to know. You don't need to come back across the ocean to get it. You don't need to go up to heaven to get it. It's here for you, right here in Ben Salem. Look at all the books. Learn anything you need to learn. It's a simple meaning of what that means. And this last source comes from Midrash Rabbah. Midrash is part of the oral tradition of Judaism. We'd like to have a conversation about where the oral tradition came from. Plenty of rabbis here, and I would also love the opportunity to speak to you. But I want to clarify, I'm not a rabbi. So, but um, it's a collection of non-halachic teachings. That's what the Medrash is. Okay, non-halachic meaning they're not legal in, in origin, but they are teachings. It's like wisdom, wisdom from from our teachers. Okay, they are our teachers who wrote the Medrash were Tanaim. Tanaim lived um, first time period. First temple period, so second, second, second temple. Okay, so about 2,000 years ago. Okay, and this is one of the things they said where it says in the beginning, Ki ha mitzvah hazos. Quickly, if we look back at source five, when it says, For this commandment which I command you today, that means Ki ha mitzvah hazos. This commandment that's what Ki ha mitzvah hazos is. So they're sharing a story on that commandment. And the story goes like this. This is a parable to illustrate the difference between a wise and unwise approach to Torah study. Rav Yanai said, to what may this be compared? It can be compared to a loaf that which is suspended in the air. The unwise person says, who can possibly bring this loaf down with us? But the wise person says, somebody put it there. So I've got to be able to get it. So he gets a ladder and he climbs, and he gets the loaf of bread. I like to emphasize this story that they're hungry people. That they're hungry people, and they come to this loaf of bread, and the unwise person, no matter how hungry he is, says, I can't do it. Everyone here today is hungry for understanding this. That's why you're here. There's no other explanation. If it was up to your kids, you wouldn't be here. Let's just be honest. You came here because you wanted your kids to be here and you wanted to come. So we're all hungry people. We can understand that, correct? The unwise approach is to say, I understand what you said, Joe. Your story's nice, but that's you. I'm me. I have different challenges in my life. I can't do it. It's a lot. The wise approach would be, our lives are very different. Your struggles are not my struggles, and mine aren't yours. But you got through your struggles to get where you are. And I just want to, parenthetically, my life is not perfect. But it's more manageable now. And I'm happy with the trajectory to where I'm going. But the wise approach would be, he did it so, so can I. Get your ladder and get on it, rung by rung. I took my ladder, and I did it step by step. I did it sentence by sentence, I did it verse by verse, I did it book by book, to get where I am now. I didn't just jump in, and I'm here. Okay, so that's that's really what I wanna leave you with. Um, I, uh, I hope that what I had to share was meaningful to you. Hope that uh, it helped you along your journey. And uh, I have to say, if you have any questions, be right here. All right, thank you very much, Joseph. We really appreciate your, your uh, ideas, your advice.